your national, your England, Wales? England and Wales, England yeah. England and Wales. Thank you. Just while um, the, they're getting the presentation set up, good morning, everybody. Thank you for the invite. It's a pleasure to come and speak to people today. Um, just the gentleman there who asked the question about email scams, just hold that thought to the end of the presentation because there's something at the end of the presentation that might cover off the point you've made because it's a really, it is a really important point um, and something that we've, do, we've been doing some work which I'll touch on at the end um, to try and help mitigate some of the, the, the issues that you've raised. Uh, and also, Lou used the example of her mum in her presentation, so on the subject of kind of confessions, um, and I'm standing up here as, as head of the e-crime team and I'm going to confess to you that I've been a victim of a, of a fraud, an online fraud, um, two or three years ago now, um, just, uh, just after payday as it happens, um, I went on online banking as, as probably most people in this room do uh, and found that my account had been emptied um, and also my wife and I have two separate joint accounts which is the secret to a happy marriage, keep two, have your own bank accounts. Uh, we also have a joint one for bills and a, and a savings account, but they're all linked because they're all at the same, um, they're all with the same bank, um, which I won't, I won't name, but it begins with an S, S and ends in Antander. Um, <laughs> and when I noticed my bank account was emptied, the money had actually been transferred from my bank account into the joint account. So I immediately, of course, blamed my wife and said, you know, I got on the phone to my wife and said, why, why have you taken all the money out of my bank account and put it in the joint bank account? And she said, well, I haven't. So sh she went logged on, looked at her bank account, and her bank account had also been all emptied and moved into the joint account. And when we actually looked at the joint account, the joint account was also empty because all the money that had been taken out of there and the savings account, which had all been transferred, and had then been moved out. It had actually been used to buy some quite expensive handbags, um, as it turned out, in Paris. Um, so to cut a long story short, we did eventually get our money back, but it just goes to show how easy it is. Somebody who, myself and my wife, who actually uh, works in trading standards um, as a... As a uh, as the head of a multi-agency safeguarding team, which specifically looks at tackling uh, doorstep criminals, which Lou mentioned a lot of in her talk. So two fairly savvy people, it's actually quite easy to get caught out by electronic crime. Um, so without further ado, um, and the confession's over, um, just what I'm going to cover this morning, and I'm conscious of time because I think we've, we're slightly behind, so I'll, I'll, I'll whisk through the first couple of uh, topics because it's really just to provide a bit of background and context. Um, in terms of our team and national training standards and where, it can, where national training standards fits into the big picture in terms of, um, as Lou mentioned, what's largely delivered through local authorities at a local training standards level. Um, I'll cover some of the examples of the work we've done. Our uh, team is somewhat slightly different to Lou's team in that our focus is on enforcement and investigations um, because, again, a bit unlike Lou's team, we, we find that in the UK there are criminals in the UK who will target UK consumers. There's an awful lot that comes from overseas, as I'm sure people are aware of in terms of online crime, but nonetheless there are people who are live, and live and reside in the UK who will target UK consumers online. Um, so I'll touch on some of the work we've done there, but also in terms of the international context of that. Uh, and then at the end, um, just some of the work we've been doing around uh, vulnerable consumers. And I think um, it's an important point to emphasise, and Lou touched on it, around vulnerability and not necessarily being... Uh, age is a factor in vulnerability, but it's not necessarily the, the single most important factor. And, for example, we've done uh, a prosecution where a guy got sent to prison for nearly six years where he targeted um, job seekers. Uh, and he advertised jobs online uh, through a lot of the um, well-known job sites uh, like um, Indeed.com and, and, and various others, Monster, um, you would see the job advertised. Usually there were jobs that would appeal to perhaps people who are pretty desperate for work and would, would do almost anything because they may have been long-term long -term unemployed. So they were vulnerable by the, their circumstance of being unemployed and really looking for work. They would uh, un undergo a telephone interview, having responded to the job advert online, they will be told that they've got the job, but in order to start work, they would have to pay for a criminal records check. So they would be then directed to a website, which the, the fraudster actually uh, owned the website, but it was made to look like what would be the uh, a Criminal Records Bureau website. You would enter your details, pay your 90 quid, 
um, and be told that your clearance had come through and you would just turn up at this place to start work in a few weeks' time. And we had examples where people had um, actually moved house, they'd put deposits down on new properties to move town, they would turn up at the premises on the Monday morning and the, the jobs didn't exist. Um, but unfortunately, we, or rather fortunately, we did catch up with the guy and as I say, he was sent to prison for nearly six years. So that, that's just an example in terms of emphasising the point around vulnerability and circumstance, which is a key factor. Um, so just very briefly, to, to sort of cover off uh, NTS and where we fit into the sort of grand scheme of things from a training standards perspective, as Lou said, um, NTS was actually created in 2012, so we've been going uh, just over seven years. Um, and it was, it was born out of a government review to look at how consumer protection was delivered, particularly at a national level, because it was seen that the infrastructure and the mechanisms that were in place, because at the time it was the Office of Fair Trading, um, wasn't really very suited to dealing with some of these big national issues, like online crime, like mass-marketed mail and, and telephone fraud. Um, lots of good work went on at a local level, but it didn't necessarily catch the big picture in terms of some of these national and, and international links. Um, so on the back of that review, NTS was created and there was a series of regional and national teams created covering a whole range of things. Um, they're the kind of primary responsibilities for NTS. This one here, actually, the Ports and Borders, is, is, is soon to be moved into what's called the Office of Product Safety and Standards. But by and large, they're the kind of key responsibilities for NTS. So from the point of view of the team that I lead, um, we've got... Kind of, well, we actually cover a whole range of things, but the two kind of important things, I suppose, in terms of those who are here today, um, we, we invest significant time and resources in investigations and enforcement um, because it's important that people are seen to be brought to book for the sorts of things that they do, particularly when there's a perceived anonymity about the internet and therefore, um, well, it's easy to get away with it. Um, so it's important, and judges have actually recognised that in some of the sentencing that we've received, in making the point that internet crime is not an anonymous, an, an, you know, perceived as, in some <coughs> cases, a victimless crime. People, people's lives are, are ruined by some of these crimes, and it's important that criminals are brought to book for it. But also, increasingly, we're doing a lot of disruption work. Um, so <coughs> that is looking particularly where there's an international element to the crime, which a lot of these cases that we look at there is. So we, um, we have a, a range of tools at our disposal that allows us to disrupt, but then we also work with international consumer protection partners um, to take action in their respective territories where we can. Um, it's primarily delivered by a couple of teams. Um, we've got a techie team, which is my background. That's where I come from. I, I'm, I'm a techie when I had a proper job, like Lou said. Uh, I, don't, I don't anymore. I come and, and speak to audiences like this most of my life. Um, but that was my background. So you, everybody carries around a mobile phone now and criminals are no different. Um, so when we're investigating criminals, we need to get our hands on their mobile phones, their laptops, their digital devices, because that tells the story of what they've been up to. It also contains vital evidence around things like suckers lists that Lou mentioned. It contains information about who they've been in contact with, who are their co-criminals. So we have a, a, a team of techies that when we go out and conduct raids, these devices are seized and they go and get forensically examined in our lab. And then we provide that support network through to other local and regional TS teams as well. And then we've got our enforcement team who they're the ones who go out and do all the sexy stuff. They, they knock people's doors down, get people arrested uh, and then uh, uh, ultimately investigate and uh, prosecute them. And it's a range of issues uh, where there's an online element. Um, so it's all the consumer protection stuff, the, the, the stuff that is ultimately frauds, as, as Lou mentioned. Although we're a consumer protection organisation and, and our, our, our um, remit starts there, we, we can and do prosecute people for fraud, um, but also things like people who sell counterfeit products online and, and, and unsafe products online. What do we do around disruption? So this is kind of just some of the stuff that we've developed over the last few years. Um, and, and there's one particular thing that I'll come on to a bit towards the end, which will touch on the, the point that the gentleman made. Um, so a, a big focus of our work is suspending and, and blocking websites. So clearly where we identify a website that might be uh, misleading or fraudulent or selling counterfeit products or whatever it, whatever it may be, um, we can um, 
request, because this is the key thing, uh, and we, we're constantly lobbying government for, for a change in powers, because we can't compel um, any organisation to take a website down. Um, all we can do is appeal to the hosting company or the domain registry, like Nominet, people will have heard of Nominet, I'm sure, um, to remove the content, but we haven't got any legal authority to require them to do so. But however, over the years, we've developed good relationships with a lot of these online service providers and social media platforms who will now work with us to get the content removed where we identify that it's harmful. Um, we can also, where um, telephone numbers are associated with websites, and I'll come on to a particular piece of work that in a second that we've done. So where there's a, uh, something's advertised online, but in order to kind of be, be scammed, you have to actually phone a number. Um, we will then get those telephone numbers disabled as well. Um, and more recently, we've done some work with um, the payment industry to look at how we can actually disrupt online payment services, because ultimately the criminals are in this to make money. So if we can stop the flow of money where people can't make payments online, um, then that's uh, clearly a, a, a good tool for us to use. So just some examples of some work that we've done. Um, copycat websites. This was uh, one, of our, one of the biggest cases we, we undertook, and this was um, an issue that probably most people in the room are familiar with. Websites that were advertised as being the official passport office, driving licence, um, apply for your driving licence, etc., etc. Any sort of official documentation that you might think you want to apply for. Um, criminals realised, and this is a common thread um, you'll see through this presentation, criminals realised that if they paid for adverts on search engines, um, so those who, um, if, you, if, you, if you do a search on Google, does everybody know that when you do a search on Google, usually the top two or three results are actually ads and people have paid to be there. They're not necessarily the most relevant um, uh, um, search results. It's just that somebody's paid for the privilege of being there. But actually lots of studies show that anywhere between, um, it depends which studies you look at, but anywhere between 40 and 50% of consumers don't make the distinction between what's an ad and what's a normal search result. So criminals have realised this with a whole range of different um, frauds. If they pay for adverts to appear at the top, consumers will just re religiously click on that link and before you know it, they're on a website and they've been scammed. So they recognised this uh, and they made, um, over a period of about 18 months, £40 million, taking relatively small sums of money but off hundreds of thousands of consumers. Um, but we managed to catch up with them. Um, they were um, based in, in Hampshire, uh, and after a series of trials, which lasted over uh, two years, um, the criminals behind it received over 37 years in prison. The main offender received 15 years, um, which, y y if you think that people who've, who've actually killed somebody will often receive less than that, um, but the judge made the point that this was sending out a message to say that people who commit this sort of crime will not get off lightly. Um, but the really good thing, from our point of view, aside from getting people locked up, is um, recovery of assets. So under the Proceeds of Crime Act, we can recover assets from criminals. And in this case, um, we recovered a, a large number of high-value motor cars which were sold. But also, literally the day we went through their door, they were in the process of buying a £1.4 million house. Um, which we allowed the sale to go through, but then restrained that as an asset. And that was sold um, in May this year for just over a million pounds. And so that money then gets returned into the pot and NTS um, collectively gets a share of that 6.1 million pounds. So that can go back into supporting the work of my team, of Lou's team and NTS more generally. So it's a really, really valuable tool because it makes sure that the criminals get their assets taken away but we can invest it in further crime-fighting initiatives. Um, subscription traps is a, is a, a big problem, uh, and these do tend to originate from overseas. Um, and I'm not talking about when you sign up for Amazon or, or, or whatever, and, and you, 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 know, you, get it, you get a free trial, and if you don't cancel it, you, you end up paying. Um, they're not deliberately trying to catch you out there. Lots of people will allow it to lapse and end up just paying their Amazon Prime subscription. But these are where it's deliberately hidden. So you often see something advertised as a free trial for usually diet pills or miracle hair regrowth or whatever it might be. Um, it's usually advertised through social media. Um, people then click through to the links, put their details in to pay for postage and packaging, um, but then the, 
keeping is they've then got your card number and they then use that card number then to take subsequent monthly payments because when you've ticked the box to say, I've read the terms and conditions and who in the room reads the terms and conditions when they sign up for these things online, buried in there down on page 327, it says, if you don't cancel after four days, we're going to start taking 80 quid a month out of your bank account. And again, thousands and thousands of people are caught out by this every year. Um, so we've done some work with the finance industry, first of all, to, to, to um, improve the way they respond to it, because what tended to happen was that consumers, once they realised, would go to their bank and say, well, I didn't authorise this payment. Um, they would, the bank would then instigate an investigation, which the trader who would then provide the, the list of terms and conditions that says, well, they ticked the box that said they'd, they'd signed the terms and conditions, agreed the terms and conditions, and quite often the bank would side with the trader because the consumers ticked. But we um, lobbied the industry to say, well, that's not good enough because clearly um, there's a principle of informed consent and you have to provide all the key information up front to what you're signing up for. Uh, and we've managed to sort of turn around the way that these are responded to. So at least now consumers can get the payment stopped because that was one of the challenges. They couldn't even get these continuous payment authorities stopped. Um, but in a lot of cases now, consumers will also get refunded um, because, it, uh, and this has then led into the uh, payment disruption services that we've been working on to try and actually stop the flow of money out to the criminals. And then finally, the Microsoft scam, which um, that's kind of the, the name it's, it's um, uh, st stuck with it, but actually it's kind of developed into something beyond Microsoft. This um, usually, and still is to a certain extent, was on the back of phone calls, um, people phoning up to say, uh, you've got a problem with your computer, I can help you fix it. Um, usually around making claims around being working with Microsoft or working with Windows, um, and largely delivered from call centres overseas. Uh, but we were actually one, we were, we were the first ever agency in the UK to, to, to actually identify and prosecute somebody responsible for this, a problem that had been in existence for a number of years. Uh, and we're actually working with partners on the further investigation because the, the way in which the criminals are targeting consumers has, has, has changed slightly over the last couple of years, um, which needs, leads me nicely onto this. So, Software service fraud is kind of the official name for the, for the fraud, um, but Microsoft scam is the one that uh, I think people tend to uh, remember. Um, and it's now moved into the online world. So where um, they relied on making lots and lots of cold calls to consumers, which colleagues in the scams team and, and at Truecall, obviously they do a lot of work to try and block these calls coming in. Um, the criminals have kind of moved on and now deliver it via online. So if you were to go online, and this, is a, a, this was a search for um, su uh, tech support for Gmail, um, but if you went and, you know, if you did sort of Microsoft technical support or um, uh, McAfee cu customer services, again, um, the criminals have invested in advertising to make these numbers appear on Google or any other search that would appear to be the official UK number to dial to get support with your Gmail. Um, and when you click through to these websites, you get a very professional looking website that looks like um, AVGs are, are quite a famous antivirus product. So it, this looks like the official antivirus uh, product support website and this 0800 number that you dial to connect to uh, an agent. But actually all you're doing is you're calling the same call centres in India that have been making the outbound calls and the scam starts all over again. And ultimately what they're trying to do is get access to your PC remotely to, quote, fix the problem, um, and then they'll avail themselves of, of, of £700 of your money to then pay for a lifetime support contract so that you don't have to worry about this problem again, but also in the process of um, having access to your computer, probably steal a lot of your personal details as well, and no doubt you'll end up on a suckers list. So it's an example of how um, what was previously a telephone scam and, and still is to a certain extent has now moved into um, the online arena and in particular, as I've mentioned, companies using search engine advertising as a way of getting consumers onto their fraudulent websites. Um, so in 2718, there was uh, um, action fraud we touched on, which is a bit of a swear word in our world at the moment. Um, there was over 30,000 complaints about this particular type of fraud um, to action fraud. Uh, and in many cases, they are 
uh, vulnerable and or elderly consumers um, because they, they tend to rely on um, just doing those simple searches and looking at what Google gives them back as an answer. Um, so on the back of that, we've done a lot of work to um, take down uh, a large number of websites that are connected to it uh, and also the social media accounts because, again, they, they invested heavily in social media advertising uh, and dozens of telephone numbers have been disabled. But we've also identified a group of individuals in the UK who are actually receiving the cheque payments when consumers sign up to this service because, again, the criminals previously used to rely on you sending a an online payment to pay for the service, but they realised that um, work that had been done to try and intervene in these payments or hi highlight that there potentially may be uh, fraudulent payments, they've resorted to now getting people to send cheques. And again, it adds to the air, air of authenticity because you send the cheque off to a UK address, so the, the vulnerable person thinks, well, it must be legitimate because I'm sending it off to a UK address. But actually all that happens is the criminals in the UK are taking a percentage of that cheque and then sending the rest of the money back to the criminals in India. And some of the other work we're doing, and it's, it, it's important, and Lou touched on it, around um, how we make sure that consumers, and, and particularly elderly and vulnerable consumers, are, are, are made aware of the types of uh, online frauds and scams that they can become a victim of. So we've done some work um, with University of Bournemouth, and Lou mentioned uh, Keith Brown, uh, the great work that they do there um, and they've just recently refreshed their cyber fraud and scamming guide uh, for um, professionals in who, who have got who interact with um, vulnerable elderly consumers so I would urge if anybody hasn't already got a copy of this are, are these generally available online Lou they are aren't they yeah, yeah. Um, so we can provide details or, or a link to get it but it's really worth getting your hands on this because it's aimed at professionals who interact with elderly and vulnerable consumers to give them an idea of the types of online frauds and scams that might be out there uh, and the signs to look for um, and we've contributed um, a number of pieces to this so some of the recent ones that we've seen um, that we feel are, and we've got evidence to show that it tends to affect more elderly and vulnerable consumers I'm sure everybody's received one of these emails recently um, saying your TV, either your TV license is overdue or you're due a refund or something connected with your TV license. They all look quite um, professional. Um, but actually there are some telltale signs and I won't go through all of the slide but if you do get the guide you'll find all of that information in there. But there are some telltale signs that, that show it's a scam. Uh, but unfortunately what tends to happen is that lots of people still fall for it. They'll go online, they'll put their personal details in, they'll certainly lose some money uh, but they'll also end up or, on a suckers list and be then target for further frauds and scams. Um, and another one we've seen um, grow quite significantly, is, uh, and again, this seems to be particularly vulnerable and elderly people who fall victim to it, is shopping coupon scams. So again, this, this will either be an email or a social media advert that, that, that claims that you can um, just complete a short survey and get a £50 Tesco voucher. But actually, all they're trying to do is get sufficient personal information from you, like Lou said, you, you, your name, your address, your age, potentially any uh, health ailments you might have. And actually, what they're really trying to do is just to get you on a sucker's list so that they can then target, target you um, for further frauds and scams. And of course, you never get the 50 quid Tesco voucher at the end of it. Um, so it's really worth getting a copy of that guide um, because it's really, there's some really, really useful information in there, aside from the stuff that we've contributed. Um, so just, just to sort of wrap up, um, I think uh, I'm preaching to the converted here, but um, clearly everybody in the room knows that factors around bereavement, co cognitive impairment, social isolation can increase um, people's susceptibility to all forms of fraud and scams. I mean, I, my world is online, but um, it's not unique to the online environment. Um, but what is interesting from our point of view is that even though we're there to try and protect consumers from online frauds, a lot of research that's been done recently does show that um, those in socially isolated environments still tend to rely on broadcast media, newspapers, TV and the like for their advice. But yet we're talking about trying to protect people online, so there's a bit of a, a, a tension there. And 
we're guilty as a team to a certain extent of that because you get so focused on it's online so therefore we'll put all our messages out online to better protect people but actually when you're looking at socially isolated and vulnerable people they're not necessarily relying on advice that's provided on social media or online to better protect them so that's a, a challenge for all of us there's increased links between real world and online so as an example um, there's lots and lots of work that goes on around tackling doorstep crime at a local level and with Lou's team. But what we've seen recently is um, people will get a flyer through the door offering to have their drive tarmac or their, their soffits and fascias repaired. Um, but it'll have a website on the, on the flyer. And we've got evidence to show that consumers will go and look at the website. Um, so it's an offline crime, it's a traditional doorstep crime, but they'll go and look at the website for some sort of valid, you know, a valid, a valid uh, validity check. Is this a kosher company? And they'll see on there wonderful pictures of all the nicely tarmac drives, uh, uh, customer testimonials from Mrs. Jones saying what a great job these people did. But actually the work we've done has, has, has identified that any number of um, rogue traders are actually using just template websites with the same custom, customer testimonials and the same pictures of the work um, which clearly can't be the case if they're on different traders websites but people use the online as a check to say well it must be all right I'll give them a ring and get them round to come and tarmac my drive so there's a real kind of collision really between real world and online that is something that we all um, really try need to try and better understand and work out how we can deal with some of the challenges um, there's there's a big thing with Elderly people do often rely on sort of hand-me-down devices, so the, 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 you know, the son and the daughter will give their old iPad or their old laptop to their, to their parents. Um, but the problem with that is it might be a bit out of date, it might be a device that isn't supported anymore in terms of having updates done. Um, I think most people will probably know that Windows 7, for example, no updates will uh, be released from January onwards for that. So if people are using a Windows 7 device or maybe handing it off to their parents, they're at risk from January onwards because they're not getting security updates and software patches. Um, so that's a, a big challenge. And really this links to kind of point two there is there is a, there's a lack of concise, clear and consistent messaging around particularly protecting online um, consumers. Um, so don't want to be all doom and gloom, just some of the uh, things that we are doing to try and deal with some of those things so clearly we want to promote events like this and come along and talk to uh, fellow professionals around the work in this area um, we're increasing the work we do with get safe online because again get safe online have recognized that in terms of elderly and vulnerable consumers they're not really necessarily c reaching the audience as well as they could um, so my colleague Steve who sat there is going to a couple of events in the north of England in the near future to try and better understand what can be done to reach out to elderly and vulnerable consumers in, through the Get Safe Online network. Um, the National Cyber Security Centre has recognised that there's lots of messages that are put out there, but I'm a techie. The people who are generally put these messages out, they, they work in the cyber world, so they understand the language and, and, and the topics, but they, don't necessarily, they aren't necessarily good getting it out to an audience so that they understand what the message is um, so we're doing some work with the national cyber security center on an initiative to put some really clear simple messages out there that hopefully will enable consumers to be better protected uh, and a key initiative for us um, this is something that we've been working on for probably coming up two years now um, and we're not quite at the point where we can launch it but this touches on the point the gentleman raised um, and this is about looking at a similar model really to what the call blockers do but in, in a virtual sense. We're never going to stop the TV licensing emails or the other phishing and, and spam emails that you get because they're, they're, the way they're distributed globally is too difficult um, for us to, to even contemplate trying to stop people ever receiving the messages. But what we can do is say to the internet service providers well, we know that when a consumer gets this email, ultimately they've got to click on a link in that email to take them off to a website somewhere, and it's the website that they then go to where they're defrauded or scammed. What can we do to stop that link working? So they'll click on the link, but it won't take them to the website. They'll get a message that says, this is probably a scam, this is probably a fraud. Um, 
and hopefully that will then stop the consumer in their tracks and make them think twice about continuing through to that website. So we've been doing some work with some of the UK's largest ISPs um, to try and, a, a bit, it's a, probably a bit like the conversation that Lou had with the Royal Mail to start with. Initially, their response is, well, it's not our problem. We're there to provide an internet service to consumers uh, and it's really then, con what it's, it's up to consumers what they then do with that service. Um, but we've said to them, well, really, no, you've got a role to play in better protecting consumers and slowly but surely they are coming on board to that. So we're hopeful that in the not too distant future we'll, we'll be launching a service that um, prevents people from ever being able to access that content. Um, but there'll be more news about that hopefully in the not too distant. And that concludes the presentation. If anybody's got any questions. <laughs>